Baker. Baker. That's right. We are back on the 49er Access podcast. My name is Sterling Bennett, and today we are previewing the San Francisco 49ers against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers NFL action week number 11. And just like I said to begin, Baker, Baker, Nick Bosa is ready to wreak havoc on Baker Mayfield this week at Levi Stadium, 105 p.m. kickoff back in Santa Clara, hoping the Niners can uh, get back on track at home, got back on track against the Jacksonville Jaguars this past weekend. They're now 6-3, and three, coming off a 34-3 win over the AFC South leading Jacksonville Jaguars, snapped their three-game losing streak, and even won the last meeting against this Buccaneers team, albeit uh, minus Tom Brady in swapping in Baker Mayfield. 35 to 7. That was the Brock Purdy broken rib game, or when he did break his ribs initially, which went on to play Thursday against the Seahawks, winning the NFC West Division. Adebo Samuel also got hurt in that game. Vita Vea also got hurt in that game. So this is on Sunday going to be a matchup of both these teams are finally healthy playing against each other really for the first time since 2019. The Buccaneers come in 4-5. and five. They themselves coming off a 20-6 win over the Tennessee Titans also snapped their four-game losing streak. So just like San Francisco, the Buccaneers think they're coming in uh, after their get-right game uh, last Sunday. So both these teams riding high. Both these teams wanted to carry over their success two consecutive weeks. Uh, I do think the odds of doing that, uh, not just slightly, but heavily favor the San Francisco 49ers, but you have to give the Buccaneers some credit here. They are four and five. They played a lot of tough games, a lot of close games, especially one against the Philadelphia Eagles early this year. They've beaten a handful of bad teams, mind you, but I do think that the Buccaneers record doesn't necessarily indicate exactly how mediocre it might say they are. The Buccaneers are a good team. They're a bottom tier good team, mind you, but I do think what the Buccaneers do well is simply play defense and have an offense that can keep them in the game, which has worked well for four games and their five losses, many of them being pretty close. Their offense is a very safe offense. Uh, They don't turn the ball over. Only eight turnovers this year ranked second in the entire NFL. And again, they allow their team, their offense especially, to just keep them in games, which the defense being so good powers them to victory. They have the third best turnover margin in football. Again, this offense is not going to give the way or give the game away, excuse me. And it's led by a former, and I hate to say this, pride of Oklahoma, Baker Mayfield, boomer sooner, baby. But also, we've seen him before in Cleveland when, in 2019, Nick Bosa had a field day planting the flag against Baker Mayfield. Uh, Saw him, I don't think we've seen him since, actually. Uh, We didn't see him in Carolina, I believe. Uh, And it feels like that right now for Baker Mayfield. He's probably having his best year since his rookie season, which is crazy to say because he had one of the better rookie seasons for a quarterback. And I can argue overall a better team with those Brown teams he had uh, with OBJ when he was healthy and Jarvis Landry and company there. But Baker Mayfield having a pretty good year. He, he's slinging it around all over the field. He is unafraid to test opponents deep. Now, they don't always hit those balls, but uh, he has he's fifth in air yards per attempt. He has the sixth best TD to INT ratio in football, and he has the fifth highest rated balls thrown 20-plus yards downfield. And when you see their offense still has perennial all-pro Mike Evans and they have a really strong Chris Godwin still out there being one of the best receiver number twos in football, you know, while the Bucs maybe don't rank high in explosive plays hit, they are going to take those shots downfield. They are going to want to push the ball downfield. Um, And again, he may not always get it, but Baker Mayfield is going to attempt the home run ball against his opponents. He's done it a lot this year. Sometimes it booms. 
Sometimes it busts, and sometimes you just live the fight another day. Baker Mayfield wants to take chances. That's kind of who he's always been. Uh, I will say this, though. The turnovers are down by a lot this year. Again, only eight total on the year for the Buccaneers offense. They're going to keep him in the game. Baker Mayfield being a massive part of their success this season. Um, I also do think the way to limit Baker, the way to scheme against him is you must play zone coverage. And knowing how the Niners have played this year under Steve Wilkes and even in previous years, it kind of feeds into what they like to do best, that being playing zone coverage. Um, it's going to be tough if you want to play man against, again, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Uh, but Baker Mayfield has been, and I mean this with my whole heart and my entire chest, say it with your chest, he has been cash money against man coverage this year. An 82.6 QBR, the fifth highest QBR in the entire NFL against man coverage. Uh, seeing Baker Mayfield top five in anything is shocking, in my opinion, knowing he's like the 17th, 20th best quarterback in football. But against zone coverage, which is San Francisco's bread and butter, he has the 48.8 QBR, that's 18th ranked in football, which is much more along the lines of who you expect Baker Mayfield to be. This game feels like a, another game like Jacksonville now with against the Buccaneers, where San Francisco's defense can stick it to the you know, stick to their basic scheme, get more comfortable, and allow their guys, their star players, to just play comfortable, basic, nothing insane, no crazy. Blitz packages just go out there and play free, play football, and almost you know keep it simple, stupid. The Buccaneers are not going to beat you with their offense. This is not a team like the Cowboys, who I know we beat them by a lot, but have a really good offense. CD Lamb's having a great year. Dak Prescott has picked things up in recent weeks. This is not a you know, LA Chargers team where you expect the offense to be the driving force behind their success, or a team like. The Philadelphia Eagles, who have Hurts and Brown and Devontae Smith and, and, and DeAndre Swift. This is a Baker Mayfield led Buccaneers team that can't run very well, has a mediocre offensive line, but a strong defense to allow them to survive. Uh, this offense is going to give their team a chance to survive. That's all they want to do. Uh, again, they're not going to be the reason why this Buccaneers team wins the game. Uh, but I do think for San Francisco's defense coming off a massive important win against a good opponent in the Jaguars, you're almost coming into this game saying we're playing a lesser opponent. We just beat a team much better than them with the worst quarterback now in Baker Mayfield compared to Trevor Lawrence. And overall, a team that in Tampa Bay has really struggled for the past five weeks that we should be able to capitalize against and what they like to do offensively well, yes, they may test us deep. Um, if we can tackle and if we can get to the quarterback, this could be one of those 35-7 to seven games uh, in favor of San Francisco once again. I also think that, again, this is going to be a game where just like last week against the Jaguars coming in talking about Travis Etienne being so explosive and Trevor Lawrence mobility, uh, the run defense was phenomenal. We saw Javon Hargrave and Kenlon Armstead pick things up. We saw the impact of having a stout run defender and chasing across from Nick Bosa, how that helps move guys like Cleo Farrell and Randy Gregory down the pecking order, giving San Francisco more depth. We also saw Fred Warner and Greg Greenlaw clean up um, kind of the leftovers and get a lot of tackles. And we saw this team come together and run defense for what felt like the first time since what we Five, week four against the Cardinals, maybe. Um, and I think this week, knowing how poor the Bucks are at run blocking and their execution, this should again be another game where the run defense gains confidence and plays really well. Um, the Buccaneers' best run blocker is their right tackle, Luke Godeke. Um, but he has a run block win rate of 70%, which is around two two percent lower than league average when five of your starters, all five of your starting offensive line, have a below average run block win rate. Um, they're not getting out on, uh, they're not 
leading the way. And like even Christian Worse, who is one of the better left tackles moving from right to left this year, um, he, he's been good at pass blocking. Run blocking entirely different, and it shows in the numbers. Again, this team has relied on Baker Mayfield to be their bread and butter all year long, and the odds that continues or they think continues against San Francisco is not going to be the case because if you're going to have success against San Francisco, um, like the Bengals had, even like the Vikings had for a short portion of that game, even a team like the Browns, who Jerome Ford ran all over this defense, you're going to have to run the football against this Niners defense to have success to win games. And I don't think the Buccaneers have the personnel or the execution so far this year through nine games, now 10, to be able to pull that off. Um, their leading rusher, Rashad White, I think is a phenomenal pass catching back, but he only averages 47 yards per game on the ground. And as a whole, the Bucs are the second worst rushing offense in the entire league. That's right. <laughs> San Francisco went from Travis Etienne and Trevor Lawrence and one of the better rushing attacks in football with Etienne being his sixth leading rusher coming into that game last week to now basically the worst rushing offense in football. If this isn't a game where they can continue their success against the run and they do struggle, then we're back to this team has serious problems. This run defense should be able to almost have a stranglehold on this Buccaneers offense, making Baker Mayfield have to be the reason they win, which I don't think if you're Tampa Bay, you want that to be the case. Um, there's a reason you lose four games in a row. You can't run and you force Baker to throw. Now, there's obviously more reasons involved in that. Not getting takeaways, not getting turnovers, just... Some things go wrong, as we've seen in San Francisco three of the past four weeks against the Browns, Vikings, and Bengals. But um, this Niners team is by far a much better team than the Bucks are. It's abundantly clear. Uh, the Bucks are going to be fighting for that, you know, nine and seven, nine and eight record, or an eight and nine record to, to hopefully salvage an AFC or an NFC South that's so bad this year. While San Francisco should be boat racing the entire NFC West and fighting for the number one seed when it's all said and done, hopefully fingers crossed. Um, this really is a, a, a game where you point to and say the Bucks really should have no business being on the same field as San Francisco. And it should be a game where San Francisco uh, really should be able to dominate from the get go. Uh, I wasn't expecting that last week against the Jaguars. It happened. If it doesn't happen again, knowing what we saw last week, I'll be disappointed, to be honest with you. Of course, every game's different. Matchups are different every single week. But if you can do that against a much better team in Jacksonville, on the road, off the bye week, you should be able to do it at home against a far worse team at home, uh, riding high after a win where your backups played almost an entire fourth quarter. Um, I'm expecting big things from San Francisco's defense. And I do think that, again, you should be able to, and I would predict they are going to be able to stop the run. So really this game is going to come down to San Francisco's pass rush, your Nick Bosa's, your Chase Young's, your Hargraves and company against Baker Mayfield. Like they're, they are going to have to get to the quarterback. Like we saw last week, five times, we have to get three, four sacks against this offensive line on Baker. Again, the Bucs are going to have to put the ball in his hands if they want to win. And I don't think that most NFL teams would trust Baker to do so. Uh, they've done it four times this year. Uh, I don't think this Sunday is going to be a fifth. But knowing San Francisco has uh, the confidence, knowing it feels like they got their groove back like Stella, right? They got their groove back in Jacksonville. Uh, the Everglades, the Swamp, it didn't, it didn't slow them down. And you're coming back to potentially a rainy Santa Clara, maybe, that the weather here is kind of funky, but um, it really shouldn't hinder what San Francisco's defensive line should be able to do against the Bucks' offensive line. If it was me, and again, who am I? But if I was Steve Wilkes, if I was Chris Kosarek, if I was Bosa and Young and company, I'd be saying, hey, guys, easy game plan here. Line up our stars on the right side of the defensive line, which I guess now you have to ask yourself, which stars do you want? Do you want Bosa? Do you want Young? Do you want Hargrave and whatnot? Um, 
I would be begging, no matter who I was, whether I was Bosa or Young, to please, please let me line up against Luke Godeke and Cody Mock. Uh, they are some of the worst pass blocking uh, right side uh, offensive linemen in, in the entire league. Um, I think Cody Mock had an awful rookie year last year. Slight improvement this year, but I do think when you have the experience and the star power like San Francisco has, um, a little improvement from the worst right guard in football really shouldn't matter. <laughs> um, and Luke Godeke just being a fine NFL starter, but also having a pretty poor year in pass pro, I do think that you can run stunts against them. And even if you don't want to run stunts, which were a problem against or for this team this year, uh, with Steve Wilkes working through those things last week, we saw them draw back the blitz. Uh, this should be a game where your defensive line, your stars, should be able to win 1v1. And when Hargrave, what seemed like against the Jaguars last week, having his best game, can take up double teams, you have Arms to taking up double teams, um, you're going to have somebody free. We're finally going to see what this defensive line should have looked like to begin the year, where you hope that because they had so many stars, it was Drake Jackson 1v1 and Clellan Farrell 1v1 winning those battles. Now the offensive lines have to pick. Who do we want to have 1v1 against? I would assume you're going to have Tristan Wirfs mainly being 1v1 against your Bosa's and Young's and Farrell's and whatnot. Um, but if you leave Godeke and Mock out there 1v1 against the Hargrave or a Bosa or Young, you are leaving yourself up for disaster. Uh, the Buccaneers should know this. San Francisco, I would like to think, definitely knows this. And this should be a game for San Francisco to come out and just attack attack the right side of the Buccaneers offensive line um outside of Tristan Wirfs uh this Buccaneers offensive line really doesn't push anybody around and when you talk about San Francisco always wanting to control the trenches this is a game where your offensive line well we'll get to them in a second at least your defensive line that was quote-unquote fed up last week against the Jaguars, and it showed by how they played, um, this should be a game where they can out physical from the get-go the Bucks' offensive line. Now, again, Tristan Wirfs, with the third highest best pass block win rate in the entire league per PFF, um, the, the other four guys aren't, aren't going to give you much of a fight. Ryan Jensen, veteran center, isn't who he once was. This is a game where San Francisco's defense should be able to control this game, the Bucks offense in the trenches, allowing the coverage to be better, allowing Warner and Greenlaw to clean up the rest as it gets on by. Um, I do think that you have to give respect to Mike Evans. Baker Mayfield loves targeting him. Um, as someone who plays fantasy, I'm sure you do as well. While it doesn't really matter when it comes to the actual game itself, um, this is a game in most games that you would start Mike Evans, right? Because he's just one of those guys you expect to have a big game every single week. And him and Baker have an amazing chemistry. Um, I do question as to how is San Francisco going to use their cornerbacks. Uh, last week, we saw uh, Lenore move inside. Is that going to be the same this week? We saw Ambry Thomas play outside. Um was last week a benching of Isaiah Oliver? Maybe. Um, we're not entirely sure just yet. Um, if it was, uh, you got Amber Thomas and you got Mooney Ward against Godwin and Mike Evans. Um, we'll see how that goes. I do Mooney Ward had a much better game against the Jaguars. Um, felt like he kind of got back to his all pro or near all pro ways, but again. I wouldn't blame San Francisco wanting to keep what they did last week on the field. It worked so well. Lenore can play against a smaller slot receivers like he did last week against the Jaguars, albeit it wasn't great against Christian Kirk. Um, the Bucks don't have a Christian Kirk. <laughs> they don't have a, a star-studded slot receiver. They have mainly two big outside guys. And if the Bucks want to put Chris Godwin in the slot – I think that's when you bring Isaiah Oliver back on the field and you have a bigger bodied slot or nickel cornerback to guard a rather larger receiver when it comes to Chris Godwin that might be able to outpower Lenore. 
Uh, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, I would expect them to roll out the exact same unit as last week when it comes to secondary play, but I wouldn't. Like last week we saw it was only Amber Thomas. I, I think Oliver played like three snaps total. He didn't play much. I do think this week we do see much more of a mixing and matching from Steve Wilkes, but it's certainly something I'm going to keep my eye on because it can be a major factor in this game when it comes to how they want to scheme up against this Buccaneers uh, offense that has two star receivers and really two big bodied players with Evans and Chris Godwin. Uh, but amongst all of those things, amongst again, Evans and Godwin amongst you know, having to get to Baker Mayfield, like the giants, like the Cardinals, like most uh, mediocre quarterbacks, Baker Mayfield loves. And I mean, with a capital L, capital O, capital V, capital ES, he loves the check down, a.k.a. Rashad White. And then we talked plenty of times over the year, that's how you eliminate or, or, or limit how much San Francisco's pass rush can get to the quarterback. Um, that's why you have players like Fred Warner and Greg Greenlaw to clean up the mess. And if something leaks out, you have to be able to tackle. Um, we saw. When they were losing games, you're missing 10-plus tackles a week. Last week against the Jaguars, we saw San Francisco cut that down to just seven. I would expect, knowing how the Buccaneers offense, I don't want to say it's older, albeit it is. It's not as shifty as the Jaguars' speed is, right? They have ETN, they got your Christian Kirks, they got your Calvin Ridleys, uh, and we saw Christian Kirk uh, break a handful of tackles against San Francisco last week, and ETN the same, albeit in a very small sample size. Now, I don't think the Bucks have that shiftiness. Now, Rashad White, he understands tackling angles and whatnot, but I do think that because the Bucks have bigger body players, they're stronger, certainly, but I do think San Francisco is going to have the edge like it did last week, minus the Christian Kirks, minus the ETNs, to be able to bring their seven missed tackles last week down to five this week. Uh, you have to tackle, and I want to see them continue to improve upon what their defense had shown last week. Again, when you have five sacks and four takeaways, and you are forcing one of the better quarterbacks at least by name value, and Trevor Lawrence to have one of his worst games all year, um, you would like to think now that you're back home, you're still healthy. Uh, uh, Trent Williams is off another week of having four days off and being 80% against the Jaguars. Hopefully he's 90% against the Bucks. This should be a game where you play even better. The score may not say, you know, 34 to three, but I think your execution should be a lot better. And I just don't think maybe outside of one to two plays in this game, the Bucks' offense can do a lot. Um, like I said over and over and over again, this Bucks' offense has name value. Mike Evans and Chris Goblin and even Baker to a certain degree. But they shouldn't be able, knowing they want to beat you over the top, knowing they're going to go for home run balls, this should be a game where you see a poor offensive line play that can't run the football in an offense that has lost or been the reason they've lost about four of their past five games. Um, you should be able to come in licking your chops, ready to tear apart a pirate flag and fire the cannons yourself at Levi Stadium and hopefully put a hole in the Buccaneers' uh, confidence when it's all said and done. And also, look, Nick Bosa hates Baker Mayfield. I don't care what he says. Oh, oh I talked to him at Waste Management like a couple years ago, and we're good now. You have two Buckeyes that witnessed Baker Mayfield plant the flag at your home field a few years back when they were in college. Uh, I would like to expect both of these players, who you hear Nick Bosa saying, happy to have you here, Chase Young. You have a a defense talking about how important he's been. And you, you hear Kyle Shanahan saying, when Nick's around people he likes, he has a lot of fun. Um, it feels like Nick Bosa is hoping to have a little more fun this week, if I was going to make a prediction, Nick Bosa gets two sacks. I think Young maybe gets one. And I'm thinking a three or four sack day from the entire defense. It should be that kind of day. They have the ability in the Bucks offensive line just isn't that good. And if they're going to play this quick game or it's checkdowns, you have players like Fred Warner and Greenlaw. And you even have 
Hufunga, who was great against the Jaguars last week, getting to pick himself, making a bunch of tackles. You have guys almost wanting to insert or or install their dominance over an opponent that is so much lesser than them. Uh, that's enough for how San Francisco's defense can stymie the Bucks' offense. Now let's get to how the Niners' offense can get through the cracks and, and maneuver around a fairly good Buccaneers defense. But first, want to remind you to leave a like on the video if you like the content so far. And um, we do this every single week, previewing games and reacting to games. I'll say this though. I am doing this at 11 a.m., 10.30 a.m. on Thursday. Uh, the updated injury report is not out just yet. comes out later today and then on Friday as well. So forgive me if something is incorrect, but I want to ask you, if you like the video, if you like the content, please leave a like, share, and subscribe, whether it's on YouTube or the audio versions. It's a free way to help the show, help build the community here we have on YouTube and on Spotify and on the podcasting platforms. Also, follow us on social media at 49ers underscore access is the Twitter. 49ers.access is the Instagram. And use our promo code 49ers access, 49 ers a c c e s s seatgeek.com and save yourself $20 off your first purchase. If you want to go to the game on Sunday, use that promo code up above right here and save yourself some money. Uh, again, I'm giving you a free discount. You might as well utilize it now. Let's get in to how San Francisco's offense that put up 34 points last week might be able to do the same against the Buccaneers defense that, again, is one of the better ones in the entire NFL. I will say this that the Bucs are holding opponents to 19 points per game. They are, when it comes to playing their style of football, one of the better defenses in football. They are literally the best red zone defense in the entire NFL, led by head coach and defensive coordinator Todd Bowles. They love to blitz. They're unafraid to play a 3-4 base defense and just say, go out and get them. Um, again, they blitz the third highest rate in the entire league, 36.4%. They want to get to the quarterback. They want to cause havoc. And we saw it last year against this Niners exact same offense with Brock Purdy at the helm. First play of the game, a corner blitz, safety blitz, bing, bang, boom. A Brock Purdy's down and is like, that hurt. Gets back up, obviously lights the Bucks up for a massive 35-point game, but you know from the get-go they are going to want to rattle Brock Purdy in the pocket and hope to get to him. Um, I will say this, though, despite all the good the Buccaneers do, when they lost four straight games, this defense gave up 24 points per game. 24-plus points per game, mind you. Like, this defense for the past five weeks has really struggled. They think they got back on track against the Titans, which the Titans just – they suck. Sorry. With the rookie quarterback, Mike Brabel is head coach. The Titans offense cannot hold the candle to what San Francisco can do offensively. We know this. The Bucks know this. And despite the pressure they want to get via blitzing, just like Jacksonville, they don't get sacks. They don't get pressures. Um, really, their defense comes down to getting takeaways and hoping they can stop you on the ground. And that's led by... Vita Vea, he is, if not the best, the second best run defending defensive tackle in football. And even last year, he got hurt against San Francisco early, so we didn't get to see what this rushing offense with Christian McCaffrey and company can do with Vita Vea on the field. He's healthy again. He's a powerhouse up the middle. He's going to be a Javon Hargrave-like player when it comes to taking up double teams. And it's going to be a massive test for players like Jake Brendel, who, my God, uh, he is going to have a massive test against Vita Vea in this game because Vita Vea can, can take over games by himself. Uh, Spencer Burford, a clean sheet last week against the Jaguars. Can he do the same? And even John Feliciano, who I think they, being Shanahan, said that because things were going so poorly, the plan was to use him like uh, Daniel Brunskill last year 
and mix him and Burford in throughout the games. Obviously, Aaron Banks is still hurt with the turf toe, not going to play in this one. So Feliciano, Brendel, and Burford have to bring their A game against uh, Vita Bea, or he's going to absolutely wreck their shop. And once he gets inside, he is going to be a, a, a bull in a china closet. You are not going to – like it's going to be end of days, <laughs> and it's not going to be fun for San Francisco's interior offensive line. Um, he leads their entire team in sacks. He has two forced fumbles, and he just opens up room for the Shaq Barrett's and the Joe Tryons and the Kalajikansis. He just does things, really everything right when it comes to being an interior offensive lineman. And when you play a Buccaneers team, he's really the one man on the defensive line you circle when every single play he's going to be in the backfield wreaking havoc and doing what you're paying him to do. He is one of the best interior defensive linemen in football. And again, if you're, if you're Felicianos and your centers and your right guards can't get a job done, it's going to cause problems for San Francisco. Um, I will say this, though. We've seen San Francisco scheme against Aaron Donald for a handful of years and really shut him down outside of one game. Now, it was the biggest game we had against the Rams, but still, um, my main concern isn't the passing game uh, against Vita Vea. It's how can you establish the run knowing that you have just a massive, massive game changer in the middle. Um, I trust Shanahan to get that figured out. He's one of the best scheme or run scheme uh, schemers in football. Um, and I do think when you're running this outside zone uh, with Trent Williams pulling on the outside, you can almost run away from Vita Vea and be okay. You also expect some end arounds from or, or with Debo, just almost taking Vita Vea's presence out of the game entirely. Uh, that's how Debo got hurt last time, I believe. I could be wrong there, but it feels like that um, he hurt his ankle or hurt his knee on an end round last year against this exact same Bucks defense that wants to tackle. They have cornerbacks that will tackle and they're great at tackling. They have safeties who want to be aggressive and come down, play in the box, and just wreak havoc too. Uh, but Vita Vea is one of the major X factors in this game for Tampa Bay. Now, we talked about the Bucks loving to blitz, and it feels like every time we do this, I have to read off Brock Purdy's stats against the Blitz because I get it, three tough games, but it feels like every defense that loves to blitz, Brock Purdy has had success against. So against the Blitz this year, Brock Purdy has 892 yards, is averaging 8.3 yards per attempt, eight touchdowns, and only one interception. Um, amongst the top five teams that like to blitz, you have the Vikings being number one. You have uh, Then you have teams like the Steelers and the Giants and the Cowboys. Um, then you had the Buccaneers mixed in. So three of the five, one of the three of the five teams they played so far in the top five of blitzing uh, defenses, um, they've scored 30 plus points against this year. I'm going to expect the same. <laughs> uh, again, 30-plus against the Giants, 30-plus against the Steelers, and 42 against the Cowboys. Um, Tampa Bay's number two. I would expect another 30-plus point game for the offense. Um, and it doesn't help the fact that Tampa Bay loves to play zone coverage 61% of the time. And again... Most blitzing teams like to play zone coverage. It helps the you know the coverage. It, hel it helps the secondary play better. It gives them some more time to read the play. But I don't know how dumb you can be. And I would expect this might change because if you're going to blitz and you know the Niners love to play and pass over the middle, you know Brock Purdy has been nearly perfect against the Blitz all year long, and you've seen him put up 30-plus points against three of the five top blitzing teams in football, um, maybe you don't run zone coverage where Ayuk and Kittle and Debo and McCaffrey can be streaking wide open with one of the best scheming pass coordinators in football, a.k.a. Kyle Shanahan, doing the dirty work of like, look, if they're going to play zone, we're going to have massive, massive windows to throw. 
which is why Brock Purdy against the Jaguars, which is very similar to the Bucks, who puts a little less, but still, there were wide open windows the entire day. There was never a concern about, oh, that was a tight coverage throw. In fact, Brock Purdy's quote unquote worst throw of the day per Kyle Shanahan, where he's saying, don't do it again, was a touchdown pass over two defenders in the back of the end zone that was a broken down play. So it feels like Buccaneers, who have a really good secondary, mind you, or a on paper good secondary that can play better than they actually are, you don't really want to run zone coverage against this offense in San Francisco. When you do, you are going to expect, you should expect, I should expect a ton of success against a blitzing zone coverage defense. It has not worked this year against the San Francisco 49ers. And the reason why the Vikings didn't get 30 points put up against them was because Purdy threw two picks and McCaffrey fumbled in the red zone. That doesn't seem like that's going to happen this Sunday. That offense is a different offense than what was shown against Jacksonville. And what was shown against Jacksonville feels more like this offense we're going to see the majority of the season. I would like to think that if you're the Bucks, you would want to play more man coverage and trust your secondary that still has Jamel Dean and has Carlton Davis, good cornerbacks, mind you, that can do a bunch of different things and are super versatile. And you'd like to trust them to get the job done in man coverage. But uh, opposing quarterbacks have a 66.9 QBR against zone, third highest in the league. So when you run zone over a lot, 61% of the time, and opposing quarterbacks have the third highest QBR against that defense, you may want to run man. I'm sorry. You want to play man against Kittle and Ayuk? Maybe you can do it against Debo, but when Ayuk has the best uh, uh, separation in football, it just doesn't spell success. In fact, it spells disaster for a Buccaneers defense that is hoping they can carry over their success against the Titans last week into Sunday against San Francisco. And even then, uh, it does feel as if, if there's any area, if there really is one place this game may come down to, and I hate to say this, it might be the red zone, which leads us to Jake Moody, who has been wildly inconsistent. It feels like every single kick, you're holding your breath. He misses one, they call a flag, he goes and gets it on, on the second try. Or he makes it barely, they call a flag, and you're like, oh my god, is he going to make the next one? He's pushing things far right, he's pulling things far left. Um, this does feel like a game where San Francisco shouldn't have a problem waltzing into the red zone. You know, do a little cha-cha into the red zone. It's once you get there that you might find yourself in some trouble. Like I said earlier, the Buccaneers defense have the best red zone defense in football. When that field gets tighter, they tighten up, the screws get tightened, and they come to play. Their entire identity is, like I said over and over and over again, our defense has to be the reason we win. They have to play nearly perfect for the offense to get 17 points a game, 20 points a game. I don't think this Niners defense is going to allow the Bucks offense to get 20 points in this game. But if the Bucks defense comes to play, we might find ourselves in a next team to score might win because the Bucks defense is so good in the red zone. If Jake Moody's missing kicks left and right and there's an issue here or it comes down to a red zone stop by the Buccaneers and your fingers are crossed and you're doing the whole, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Mother Mary, please save us from this disaster, uh, you may be hoping Jake Moody isn't out there. Because this game could, if everything goes not to plan for San Francisco and the Bucs do come to play their A game, that Jake Moody's the reason they're going to win or, or, or lose this game. And that's horrifying. Um, now, that's the worst case scenario. That is the, you know, last call to plan, a last call to action, because on the season as a whole, uh, San Francisco should be able to execute in the red zone. 61% this year, sixth in football. But it's when you look at the past three weeks, only a 40% success rate 
in the red zone, 25th in football. Now, against the Jaguars, numbers are kind of skewed because they had Sam Darnold in the last drive, and they were force-feeding Christian McCaffrey. So maybe it's a little different, but um, it does feel like San Francisco should have no problem getting to the red zone. It's about executing in the red zone. Because looking at the Buccaneers' defensive stats, they give up 5.5 yards per play. That's 26 in football. And they allow 267 passing yards per game, the second worst in the entire league. Like I said earlier, they struggle over the middle of the field, give up a ton of yak. Um, when Devin White is targeted, he gives up a 70 plus percent completion rate and has given up over 156 yards of yak. That's fifth highest among all defenders. They're giving up almost six yards a pop of yak per play. That's 27th in football. We saw this Niners defense just run right, or offense, excuse me, run right down the field against Jacksonville's defense like it was butter. Just cut right through it. I'm expecting the same thing to happen on Sunday against the Buccaneers. Like we're talking Purdy, 300 plus passing yards, a couple touchdowns. It it's to a point where I'm thinking of starting him over Patrick Mahomes in fantasy. And I hate doing that because it's like this doesn't feel right, but it feels as if the Niners should be able to just cut right through this Buccaneers defense. But again, they can get to the 20. It's what you do inside the 20. San Francisco can't be the red zone offense they've been the past three weeks. They have to be who they were the first five weeks. If that's up you know, around 50% or 60% again, this game is going to be over so quickly. Like we're talking, you know, if, if last week was, you know, the get right game against the Jaguars, this is the stay right game against the Buccaneers. Because all the stats, all the tape, all the play, everything, which is most weeks for San Francisco, mind you, but it feels as if the Niners should have themselves a quite the offense performance against the Buccaneers defense. But again, like I said over and over again, when you get inside the 20, you can't waste a play. You can't rely on Jake Moody to get you a field goal. You This offense needs to get in the end zone. It's going to be tough because when you do so and you get in the 20, linebackers play closer to the line. It's harder to pass. It feels like that's when the run defense for the Buccaneers picks themselves up. That's when Vita Vea comes into play. And all of a sudden you're sitting there at, at, at third and six or third and eight and you're like, what the frick happened? Like, like what's going on? The Niners offense has to execute in the red zone. They are going to have, they're going to be having a Sunday stroll. La, da, 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 driving on into the red zone every single drive all day long. But once you get there, you have to park the car, right? You can get to your destination. Like there's a Walmart five minutes down the road from me. It's always packed. When I get there, I'm just like, this is an easy drive to Walmart. I get there and I'm like, there's no freaking parking anywhere. I got to park a mile away just to get to the Walmart to go buy a freaking, I don't know, a cantaloupe or something like that, right? Some batteries, right? San Francisco has to be able to park the car. If you don't park the car, then you're hoping Jake Moody's hitting those 35 chip shots that have been not uh, not the easiest thing to get done this year for the Niners offense and special teams unit. Um, the Buccaneers cornerbacks on paper, Carlton Davis, Jamel Dean, Ryan Neal. Um, it's a pretty good unit as a whole. Uh, Carlton Davis. He's not who he's been the past few years where Davis and Jamel Dean, you're pointing to and say, hey, like these guys might be number one receivers in football, excuse me, number one cornerbacks in football guarding, you know, number one receivers. Uh, Carlton Davis this year opposing QBs are 28 for 41 against him, 414 yards and three touchdowns. Um, that's truly not great. Uh, Jamel Dean a little better. 
Um, 26 for 38 against him, only 289 yards and two touchdowns allowed. Much better from Jamel Dean compared to Carlton Davis, but, and this one kind of stings because uh, safety, strong safety Ryan Neal, um, who he was in Seattle the past couple of years, um, he has been one of the worst coverage players when it comes to playing safety. Um, he's given up 20 of 23 uh, attempts near him for almost 400 yards and four touchdowns. He's currently injured, has a thumb injury. Not sure if he's going to practice today. Wasn't practicing earlier. Might be a game time decision, but even then, you might be playing a backup strong safety across from the always awesome Antoine Winfield Jr. Um, and again, it does feel like that Brock Purdy should have himself quite the day on Sunday that his performance against the Jaguars might not be the better of the two when it's all said and done uh, after uh, four o'clock hits in Santa Clara. You might be saying offensive player of the week, and you might be pointing to him saying, again, uh, when do we call this kid elite? This is the game where I think you can really run a rough shot all the way through the Buccaneers defense and really uh, just – Make a team that is only a handful of years removed from a Super Bowl win. Uh, that different head coach, different quarterback, and a lot of different moving parts. But that defense is very much the same. Um, you can run right through it, I think. And I think you should have a chance to make a Bucks defense that wants to tout themselves as being good and, uh, and keep them in games. You might be able to uh, skew their stats a lot in the negative uh, factor. I want to talk about Christian McCaffrey for one second here because um, didn't get a touchdown against the Jaguars. It stinks. It sucks. Uh, didn't break the record. Uh, and this Buccaneers defense, again, only 3.7 yards a carry. That ranks sixth in football. Um, I, for one, am saying, why don't we start another touchdown consecutive game streak with McCaffrey? Uh, this, in my opinion, should be a game for Jordan Mason, he's not going to get play because Shanahan is not going to do it, unfortunately. But if there was a game where CMC is getting a 3.7 yards of pop and you can't get things established and, you know, you don't want to throw it 45 times, I would put in Jordan Mason, give you a bigger body guy to burst through a pretty good defensive line for the Buccaneers. But despite that, the Jaguars one week ago were the third best run defense in football and San Francisco put up 144 yards on the ground. And I would like to think had they not, you know, kind of given up towards the end, they would have gotten some more. Um, now the Jaguars are a far more worse tackling defense than the Bucks, but uh, Shanahan's offense in San Francisco has kind of been a, a, a known Todd Bowles defense torture. Um, he, in 2019, when San Francisco won 31 to 17, uh, they rushed for 98 yards, and that was without Chris McCaffrey. That was, you know, the Tevin Coleman, Matt Breida run gain for San Francisco. Uh, Raheem Moster hadn't exploded yet on the scene. That was the first game of their really come out party when Sherman got the pick to seal things up. I think Richie James had the first touchdown of the season against the Bucs. It was an insane, really crazy game for us here in Santa Clara and San Francisco. Uh, then last year, with Brock Purdy, with Chris McCaffrey, with a then Debo-less offense, uh, San Francisco scored and won 35-7 and put up 209 rushing yards on the ground. Um, so... Um, the concerns about, you know, run defense for the Bucks is so good, and, and it is. Trent Williams is back completely healthy, hopefully, or at least closer to full health. Um, we saw what it meant to get him back last week, where there were defensive players saying, business decisions have been made. I'm turning my back. I'm going out of bounds. I want no piece of number 71. And, again, like I said, against or after that game, he is an offensive weapon for San Francisco who opens up so much for this offense. You want to establish the run. Uh, you should have no problem going behind Trent Williams. Um, I don't think you're going to be able to run up the middle 
in this game. So get on the outside, find the corner. You have the best running back in football to do so. And I think that this play Jordan Mason somewhat. This is a game where you want a bigger body guy out there. He can take some hits, get you some tough yardage, and he's not going to break down. This is a game for J.P. Mason to get some run. And I think would help this offense get some carries and really add something to the offense that's already rolling after their win over Jacksonville. And I do think that, you know, Shanahan versus, like, this is not Shanahan versus Dan Quinn. This is Shanahan, or this isn't Shanahan versus Jim Schwartz, where Schwartz is own Shanahan. This is vice versa. Uh, Shanahan's offenses just own a Todd Bowles led defense. I'm expecting like 120 yards on the ground. Uh, if you want to take the high end, pick in between their 2019 and 2022 performances and say 154, right? Um, I'm really expecting San Francisco's offense to roll in this game over the Bucs. Um, Iuke should be open if you're going to play zone. And even if you're going to play man, um, I am completely expecting Iuke to be open and separate against good Good secondary pieces. Um, Kittle, if you're going to put Devin White on George Kittle, uh, lock it up. Because <laughs> um, he's going to have another big game. Uh, Levante David's a great linebacker across from White. One of the most underrated linebackers somehow still in football. Um, I do think that he's going to do his job. He's, he's Mr. Consistency. When he isn't out there, the defense looks entirely different. Um, but I think Devin White has been a liability in the passing game. And I think you're going to see a Bucks defense that if you don't, if they don't hit the Niners offense early and get a takeaway or kind of steal momentum, uh, you're going to have them or should have them on their heels all day long. And if you're San Francisco and, and you're going to see an opponent sitting on their heels, playing scared, um, well, uh, that's not a good sign <laughs> for an opposing defense playing scared against a 30-plus point performance uh, when opposing defenses like to blitz and you have Brock Purdy playing like one of the best QBs against the blitz this year. Uh, I think this game ends when the final buzzer hits, when, the, when it says 0-0 on the clock. I think San Francisco wins this game 34-16. I want to give the Buccaneers some credit. Um, I don't like coming into games expecting a blowout. Um, now I am picking an 18-point point differential, but still, I think San Francisco comes into this game with a 10.5-point favorite. Um, so, obviously hit the over, but there is a real chance that we're sitting here looking at a 21-24-16 victory 24 to you know or 17 to 10 because you have to have Jake Moody hit a couple of field goals because your offense can't get it done. Um the Bucks aren't a great team, but they're four and five for a reason. They seem to play up to opponents and then play down to opponents as well. So you don't really know what Buccaneers team you're gonna get. If they play well, um Jake Moody might be the MVP of the game because or you're gonna need him to be the MVP because you need him to hit those field goals. He is going to be a massive reason as to why you win if the Bucks, which I expect them to do, tighten up in the red zone. But if you can hit some big plays, if Purdy's throwing the ball 20 plus yards downfield, you can get your guys some space. And if things are going your way, uh, once you get to the red zone, um, this could be a blowout, 34 to 16. Or again, uh, this could be Jake Moody's best game or most important game of his young young career. That's all I have for you. I want to thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, and just thank you for tuning in every single week. I really appreciate it. Um, we're on our second half of the season run, building up next week, Seattle week, in two weeks, Philadelphia week, then in three weeks, back in Seattle week once again. So the big games are coming up. You win this one on Sunday. You find momentum. And hopefully, if you are the Niners, 
It's a massive game. You hope Seattle loses this week. You hope the Chiefs can knock off the Eagles and you start to gain some ground and find your way maybe by week 13 back up nearly tied or maybe one game away from being tied for the number one seed in the NFC Conference. It's not over yet. A lot of football to be played. The next three or four weeks are maybe the most pivotal of the entire season. I think San Francisco gets it done 34-16 to on Sunday. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Hope you like, share, and subscribe to the show. Hit that like button on YouTube. Leave a review on the podcasting platforms. Give, give us five stars. Say whatever you want in the comments. I could care less. Five stars. You can crap on us all you want down below in the comments. Be sure to follow us on social media at 49ers underscore access is the X or Twitter. 49ers.access is the Instagram. Over 21,000 on both those platforms combined when it comes to followers. Let's keep that growing on the podcasting platforms, on social media, and on YouTube. If you want to go to any game this year for a small discount of saving $20, use our promo code 49ersaccess, 49ersaccess at SeatGeek. Dot com and save yourself $20 off your first purchase. Again, thank you for liking. Thank you for commenting. Drop your prediction down below. Leave a like, leave a review. And until next time, my name is Sterling Bennett. This has been the 49er Access Podcast. And stay faithful.